Hello, Robs. We're back with more books. As you can tell, we're not at Barnes and Nobles, and there's no cats inside the house. And the fireplace looks like a Japanese horror monster. Yeah. And I don't have a helmet cam, and I'm not editing anything ever. All right, let's get to the books. Stopped at um, one thrift store today. Not expecting much. Is this thing not going to focus or what? Come on. There we go. Not expecting much. And there wasn't much, but then they brought out a huge basket of books. These paperbacks were all 60 cents a piece, but I got some exciting titles. Almost as exciting as making a sticker off the back. Yeah. Let me shake it. Somebody complained about me shaking the camera while I read. Listen to me. I'll do what I want. And you'll see books on here that you won't see anywhere else. I said, am I going to Barnes and Noble? Unless I have to. Unless I'm forced to. All right, I'm done with this freaking sticker. No, I'm not. I will not give up. Look at that. There's a little kangaroo on there. Pocket books. Little kangaroo, bruv. New York. The slave who became an emperor, revolt, raged in Haiti, black against white, slave against master, the downtrodden against the legions of Napoleon, and the blacks won, a man of tremendous vitality, and virility rose and led them to bloody victory. They crowned him emperor. Henry Christophe was a giant among rulers with tremendous strength, Obsessed by a magnificent dream, adamant in his determination to make his people throw off their poverty and earn an honored place in the company of free men. But despite his fortress, his fortune, and his palace, Christoph could not drive his people to the greatness he demanded of them. And in the end, only two things remained. The sure knowledge that his tropical Haitian empire would crumble and a golden bullet with which to kill himself. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's a great, great story of hope and hope and hope and hope. Black Majesty by John W. Vandercook. The extraordinary story of the most powerful Negro of the New World, Henry Christoph, Emperor of Haiti. Nice outfit. The Sharing, Martha Moffat and Cy Cook. Was there nothing they wouldn't do to gratify their lust for evil? It was a story so bizarre it could have been a been one of reporter Sam Newman's TV specials. It began at a Soho gallery. He could still feel the revulsion evoked by the enormous canvases, gruesome, disturbing images of an ancient blood ceremony. Something was grabbing at his mind, twisting his unconscious with a dark, shuddering dread. A young girl had been drugged and abducted, terrorized and tortured, and his girlfriend, Hallie, was lured into the same web of terror, mesmerized by an insidious evil that would slowly devour her. Now, deep in the chilly quiet of the Catskill Mountains, with an eerie hypnotic beat ringing in his ears, Sam watched, petrified from the dark shadows. Suddenly his blood ran cold, a sickening bile rose in his throat. There, before his disbelieving eyes, was a grizzly, hideous ritual throbbing with the frenzy of a savage nightmare at its center was Hallie 
Oh no. He's a demoness, bruv. Speaking of demonesses, I don't know how other men wake up about their wives walking out. Did I just say wake up? I don't know how other men feel about their wives walking out on them, but I helped mine pack, and she was the only human being I ever gave a damn about. That's Breaking Up, a novel by W.H. Manville. Okay, baby girl, it's going to be okay. Un uninhibited and modern. There's a novel unlike any you have ever read. It is the story of a man beyond innocence, of a woman aching for experience, and of their remarkably... Merc I can't even speak. And of their remarkably intimate involvement. You will never forget it. <laughs> Breaking Up introduces a new note into the famous school of Hemingway. Whoa. It's Hemingway-esque, bruv. Strong, masterful, virile. It is a first novel in this great tradition. Influence of Salinger and Spillane. Tender, tough, poignant insight studded with intimate confessions. Here was this bullshit. He was too much of a lover, not enough of a husband. And when she left him, he helped her pack, knowing that she was the only human being he ever gave a damn about. The only woman he ever really wanted. Breaking up. The emotions in this novel are autobiographical. The characters and events imaginary. 1960. I don't know how other men feel about their wives walking out on them, but I helped mine pack, and she was the only human being I ever gave a damn about. Saw my mother buried with less feeling than the emotions that squeezed my heart when I would sometimes sit on the edge of the tub watching June take her bath. Her hair up in a psych, psyche knot, her face larded cold cream white, a water straight cigarette on her lip, a shy smile in her eye for me. When I woke up that day, she was already dressed and making me coffee. She was pulling at a cigarette taking a couple of bangs at it, stubbing it out, lighting the new one. Her eyes were red. Christ, she said when she caught me watching her. When I woke up this morning, my throat felt so bad. I didn't know how I was going to get through my usual two packs today, but I'm beginning to think I'll make it. And she smiled, and then she cried, coming over to put her head on my shoulder, crying, kissing me on the cheek, just below the eyes, whispering a name, no... One, but the two of us has ever heard her call me. I don't want to hurt you, she said. And then she told me she was leaving. That's the kind of girl she was. The survival machinery cut in. And without really knowing what, what I was doing, I reached over for a paper napkin and make her, made her blow her nose. She quieted under my hands, obediently blowing when I told her, allowing me to wipe her eyes. She wasn't any more conscious of what I was doing than I was. She was just waiting for my stunned attention to come back to what she had to say. I found myself unable to hear her out, interrupting with cold, lunatic logic to ask if she wanted the apartment. It was a pretty good one. His apartments go in New York right on... I can't read this trip. Speaking of tripe, christened in blood, raised in sin. Now she's sweet 16, let the party begin. Would have been nice if you focused on her eye, you shitty Android camera. Oh well, you couldn't do it. Look at that sparkle on her. Mm hmm. She has a nose ring. A 
nightmare novel of love betrayed and vengeance without end. Ruby, a story of innocence enslaved by unspeakable evil. Ruby, a tale so raw in its passion, so unrelenting in its horror that it will possess you. Oh, look at that. It's pulled away from the cover. Ruby, a love affair with the supernatural. She was Ruby's daughter, Leslie. Beautiful but silent, haunted by forces which seethed within her with a deathly rage. The love child of Ruby Claire, nightclub singer in the 30s, and the handsome, tempestuous, dark-eyed gambler, Nick Rocco. When Leslie was conceived... Ruby had another man in her life. Edward S. Aaron's Nightmare, Blackmail, Booze, Adultery, and Greed exploded into violent death. Twisted mind guided the scalpel. Pain roared through his shoulder. He couldn't see him yet. See, beyond the intolerable torture and glare, the dwarf's voice came from somewhere beyond the haze. I have a girlfriend, you know it, whispered. She plays at being a nurse. She likes to watch me work because she wants to see men suffer. What the fuck is this? Oh, man. I can't pull this off. This is Stephen King. Salem's Lot. I always hated this movie when it came out. My brother loved it. I was just like, what is this bullshit? But this is apparently an early edition of the paperback, although it is in rather poor condition. The hybrid. From a heritage of inhuman horror came the hybrid. Child spawned in an inhuman past. The happiest day in the Clayton's lives was when they adopted five year old Terry. He was the perfect son until he began to speak of the well. <laughs> the hour of the ox run dead. The most terrifying town since Salem's lot. Hey, there it is. Let's see what happens. What was wrong with this picture? Ox Run Station was the very picture of a charming old New England town, complete with warm and wise old folk, handsome young couples, healthy, happy children. No visitor could have suspected the truth. Natalie Windsor was no visitor, but she was an outsider. She had married a villager only to see him die in a way that went beyond all nightmares. She had chosen to stay only to learn too late why she should have fled. Now she was trapped as the door to hell began to open on schedule. Terrifying. And speaking of terrifying, his royal blood was cursed. Forever he would, he would bear the mark of the god forsaken. As the Inquisition spread its fiery fingers across the land of Spain, holding kingdom and king in its terrible grip, a new horror would rise to challenge even the invincible power of the Grand Inquisitor. A curse on the house of King Alonso that came from the very devil. Death dreams. She was caught in the limbo of the living dead, a nightmare of sleepless haunts, relentless terrors, and death dreams. Began like most horrors without warning. Her return to life brought with its knowledge of life after death of another world where the ghost of her child wanders until her death is avenged. But her death was only the beginning. It would take more than a year to pass before it was over. It would fascinate a nation, terrorize a town, and consume a family. The child sellers, she would kill or be killed to save her son from them. Look at these bastards. 
These murderous bastards who are stealing the children. These words were spoken by a horrified mother, a woman who had lost her husband and traveled with her only child to a small main town for peace and quiet. My God, they have my son. Alfred Hitchcock's Happy Death Day. First book publication, Alfie's Throwing a Party. So get set for a bloody good time. I'm on to my house. Alfred Hitchcock, that well-known host of horror, has decided to throw a blast to end all murder orgies. Every fan of the Master of the Macabre is invited to come to his little marble crypt at the edge of the cemetery to enjoy the fiendish fun. You can be sure of the quality of the entertainment when you take a look at his guest list of spell, binding, writing talents with novelettes and stories by such great names as a bunch of people I've never heard of. <sighs> Johnny, you got a problem. You got a problem with Johnny. Another for your best mystery collection. Johnny, you okay? In the top echelon of mystery writers, no name is more admirable than that of Patricia Moyes. A new book by Patri Patricia Moyes is always a joy. The hell's Johnny all about her? What's better than an author who can write a cr cracking good mystery? Begins with Emmy Tibbetts' attendance at a reunion of WAF and WAF. I know, Johnny's underground, that's all I know. Olivine Potty by Agatha Christie. You can spell the, see the proper spelling of Halloween. This book is from 1969, though I'm sure the original was earlier, but I don't know. I mean, how fucking old is Agatha Christie? Is she like one of those made-up people, too? Like, what's that name? Lillian Jackson Braun? No, that wasn't her. I have like seven different copies of that book in different editions. Ayn Rand, Full Beginners by Andrew Bernstein. Illustrations by Owen Bros Brosman. And there's a postcard inside. What's this? Louise Jenkins, you're due after 10 09 for a dental cleaning. I think you know uh, the beginner's books are basically just light-hearted little fun for intellectual laughter and joy. Image of America, Reno, Nevada, which I intend to sell for 10 bucks. I pay for a bunch of books. True Irish ghost stories, haunted houses, banshees, poltergeist, and other supernatural phenomena. Two thousand five Dover edition. I wonder if I already have this book. Anyway, I paid 60 cents for it, so who cares if I have it? Prairie Colt, another book I bought to resell. By Stephen Holt, illustrated by Wesley Dennis. That's on the striped pussy. Come on, buddy. Come on. Prairie Colt. 
big red hoisted the cat in the air, page 45. See this illustration. Let's see the striped pussy. Oh my God, he did. He did hoist them into the air. He wouldn't do that to Fanacat. Fanacat would murder him. All right, I'm going to sell that too. And again, we have another copy of Pizza Tiger. Just bought a copy at that same store last week, but this is the soft cover, which you don't see very often. Just assuming it's one of those which we call it books, um, book club editions. This book is in falling apart shape, but don't care. Just using it to read. This book, as I've said previously, used to be big seller back in the day when no one else, back before they started using cell phones to pick up the ISBN and determinants value. This was a twenty thirty dollar book. Now it's probably about ten twelve dollar book, ten to fifteen dollar I should say. My father died on Christmas Eve when I was four years old. Mother took me to the funeral and held my hand as he walked up to the casket. I was frightened. Didn't seem right. For Dad to be lying there. Pulled away from her grip and jumped up on the casket. I grabbed him and hugged him tight, crying, Wake up, Daddy, wake up, Daddy. Her little house in the county near Ann Arbor, Michigan. Seemed empty to me from then on. I have many memories of that place in the yard around it. Where I used to play, my earliest recollection is of running after Dad when I was about two years old. I wanted to be with him wherever he went. I remember watching him at work outside the house and wondering why he used three nails instead of one to fasten a board. Beyond my childish impressions, most of the things I know about my father are from my mother's diary, which she has kept daily since she was 12 years old. A few years ago, she made photocopies of all the pages that pertain to me and gave them to me for Christmas. My mother came from Chelsea, a small town near Ann Arbor. Her father, Warren Geddes, had been a promoter traveling by train from town to town around southeastern Michigan to show two real movies that were followed by vaudeville acts. He later owned the Princess Theater in Chelsea, and the Electric Theater in Almont. Perhaps I got my entrepreneurial instincts from him. My mother was a junior in high school when she met my dad. It's actually kind of interesting. I don't know how old Monahan is now. He was born in 37, so he's 63, 87, 86, 87 this year. He was a pretty bad owner of the Tigers, but whatevs. Anyways, it's the story of Domino's and the Detroit Tigers and his rise to probably billionaire. I don't know if he ever made that status, but he was pretty rich. Seems like a good guy, but he wasn't a very good owner of the team. All right, that's going to be it. But goodbye, Bob. Goodbye.